Okay, um, so everyone, and thank you all for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we publish mobile games, and we do that by providing an end-to-end -end solution. Now, our base of operation is in Israel, but I'm going to start in Bulgaria, where a developer of a game called Pixies live. And Pixies is a rather addictive puzzle game where you have a creature that you have to lead to its destination, and you do that by placing different uh, power nodes on the screen. Each one is different. One makes Pixies jump, the other one makes him sli uh, slide, the other one makes him change direction. In a way, the game reminded me of the Incredible Machine game before it was called uh, The Amazing Alex. And when I got the game for the first time, I started playing it, and I saw that they've implemented a nice star system in the game. So if you collected the stars in the game, it was either on display in the level selection screen, like they do in a lot of uh, mobile casual games, and if you failed to do it, it would remain half transparent. So I played the first level, I was playing level, uh, the first level, and I, I didn't manage to collect the star, I don't know why, and I moved, on to, I moved on to the second, third, and fourth level, and not only that I didn't manage to collect the stars, but I didn't even see the stars. So at that point, I realized that not all of the levels contain stars, and I continue to play. But when I reached level 10 and still didn't see stars, I realized there must be something wrong in the game. So I decided to have a phone call with Stoyan, that's the developer of the game, and we had a Skype phone call. And he was holding a cigarette in one hand and a bottle of, uh, of beer in the other hand. And we were having the, those kind of video phone calls, very friendly ones. And I told Stoyan about my experience. And what Stoyan told me, that it was not a bug, rather a feature. See, if you didn't manage to collect the stars in one of the first level, the star system would then be deactivated, which means that you have to collect all the stars in, it, in order to see them in the following levels. Now, I didn't get it. I mean, for me, it didn't make sense. So I told Soyan that since I don't understand the star systems, many players won't understand it as well. And in return, Stoyan told me, that's fine. The game is not meant for everyone. I understand, I, say, I said. But I've been playing games since I was very young. And moreover, many uh, members of my team uh, feel strongly about it as well. In return, Stoyan gave me an even more curious version of the same reply. That's fine, he said. The game is not meant for everyone. Now, Stoyan has a point. I mean, I'm not completely crazy. He thought that not of, the game is not intended for everyone, but those who will play the game will understand how the star system works. I, on the other hand, thought that the game can be played by anybody, but those who play won't realize why the phenomena they see is happening. So, who was right? Looking at the right-hand chart right here, we see the level of activity uh, according to the level of activity according to the level of the game. And what you see is that Soran was right in a way because a lot of players started to, get, to, play, to play the game and then they stopped. But we did see a very high level of activity in the more advanced levels. But looking at the star collected by the level, which means how many stars, what is the percent of the stars that was collected by the level played, we see that even those who played the game didn't manage to, didn't manage to collect the stars which brings me to the most important slide in the presentation. <laughs> um, well, in our company, we don't use data analysis only to ensure positive, a positive ROI. Um, it's the base for every discussion that, is take, that takes place in uh, minutes. So instead of debating, we test. Instead of estimating, we extrapolate. Um, and we have developed a paradigm that is based on development, testing, analyzing the data, and then relaunching the game again to the market. And since we work in, the, in Google Play, you can do it quite fast. We don't have to go through the approval stage like you have uh, to do in the uh, Apple App Store. And for us, launching a game is basically only the start of the process. So we have 50 games in the market. Uh, we collect the data from all of these games. We have 25 million users, 60 million sessions per month. 2.5 billion different actions per month, and 25 gigabytes of information per day. And that's a lot of information. So 
when you come to examine this uh, amount of data, it's really important to be focused. So we discovered that if we follow uh, four main steps, it's really easy to do. And I'm going to say something that will sound a bit trivial, but if you ever did some data analysis yourself, you know that you don't really follow through these guidelines. So it's really important to do it every time that you work. And the first step is to know exactly what it is that you want to measure. The second stage is to find the quality benchmark. Because if you have a question and you don't have a benchmark, you want to know what it means. You just get a number, an equation, or a trend, but you have to have something to compare it to. The third stage is quite technical, just measuring your information, comparing to the benchmark. And the fourth stage, a step, just requires you to be a little bit creative and to conclude the right conclusions. And so I'm going to talk a little bit right now about high-level things and how you can uh, implement this method, for instance, in Google Play, which is uh, where we distribute our applications. So distributing applications and games specifically on Google Play somehow reminds me of how you optimize um, a website on Google search engine. And there are four parameters that eventually will determine whether your game will become a success or you fail. You have the uninstallation rate, which means how many people are uninstalling the game after install, uh, uninstalling the game after installing that. You have the rating of the game, the number of downloads it gets in this category, and the number of crashes. Now these very uh, high level parameters are affected additionally by the session length, usability, level progression, lifetime of user. Uh, for instance, if a game produces a very short amount of se a very short uh, session length, uh, it's also indication that the game is not in uh, engaging, and later on result uh, in people uninstalling the, the game from their device. Um, finding a benchmark is probably one of the trickiest things that we have to do, because on the one hand, there's a lack of information in today's market. It's really hard to find the exact answer to the exact question you're, ans uh, you're uh, asking. And second of all, there's a flood of misleading information and inaccurate inf uh, uh, data. Um, so there are four ways you can get a benchmark. You can either use your own data. You can research for the data yourself. And that's not expensive. That's actually quite free. But it's hard to achieve sometimes. You can buy research. And you can find a partner that has information that you're looking for. Every one of these methods has different advantages and different uh, disadvantages. So you can pick uh, what you like the best. Now, there's nothing uh, that I can say that in a high level perspective on measuring, comparing, and drawing conclusion. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how we did it in Mominis. So going back to the four steps, we wanted to see um, whether the session length of our games are meeting the standard of the industry. So we went to Flurry's reports, and we found that the industry standard at the time was eight minutes. Uh, per game, and it went up to 20 minutes for a social application like non games like Facebook. And then for the measure and comparing part, what we do is basically measure the uh, session length for Ninja, Ninja Run, Ninja Chicken, My Pyramid, games that we publish, and Playscape. And what was interesting to see is that there's a big variance between different games, which means that we as developers can really affect this number. So it goes from eight minutes to 25 minutes of Playscape. And to really understand why, it's, why it happens, we can have a look at of what Playscape is. So Playscape basically is an application a game, if you may say, that uh, creates a vertical play between different games. It gives you transferable virtual currency and experience points. So what you do is to play vertically into one game, complete missions, get experience points, and go to the other. So the, very, the, the most distinct thing about Playscape is that the experience is very, is very diversified because you don't play one game, you play many games. Um, so that's very important because if you want to create a better session length, instead of creating more levels and adding more features to the same gameplay, you might want to create a different gameplay, a mini game within the game. This kind of method really helps. Now, to diversify the gameplay, is somehow very expensive. It takes a lot of um, resources and time. And so we were thinking, OK, that's OK. 
So what can we reduce from the game? Because we can't, uh, well, continue playing, continue developing the games year and years and years. So we thought maybe we can take down some of the levels. And we started to think, how many levels should a game contain? Now, what we see right now in the industry is that the st standard for casual games is set pretty high. So that's kind of weird because also according to our data, we know that 50% of the users sometimes don't even get across level 10. So we see a very weird phenomenon. On the one hand, we see a lot of developers creating many levels. On the other hand, you see a lot of players that don't really want to play so many levels. And the question is, why does it happen? I mean, do the developers not know? I mean, they must know. They must know that the players are not playing their levels. Maybe they just want to justify the price of the game, but when you give the game for free, there's really not any reason uh, to create so many levels. And anyway, maybe it's a, a problem of perception. Maybe uh, developers are afraid that if they will launch your game to the market and want to put a lot of levels inside, uh, the reviews will, um, they will get bad reviews. Uh, but reviews don't create a lot of traffic. In any case, what I'm, sure of the, what I'm sure of is that in many cases, there is no reason to create so many levels in the game. So we decided to test it. And we took off our games and created an average. We actually started to measure not the uh, unique users playing levels. We measured the amount of activity by the level. So what we see here is that most of the activity takes place in the first level, and then it goes quite rapidly down onwards to the 20th level. And then at the 20th level is actually a little bit, it's a little bit misleading it's not, because it's not a level. It's actually a group of levels. It's all levels above 20. And what is very clear here is that the amount of activity that takes place in this group of levels is higher than what you see in level six. So I wouldn't imagine creating a game that contains only six levels. Um, but on the other hand, creating a group of the level, you know, the group of uh, the levels above 20 might be a much more expensive because it might contain 10, 20, 30 additional levels. But on the other side, the people that are playing, the players that are playing here on the 20th group are twice as likely to pay money. They're much more engaged. And if you're trying to cost some your games, they will play additional games. So what do you do? Um, so in this specific question, the answer is not a number, rather a trend um, or a graph, if you may say. If you create a game and you see that the level of activity looks somehow like this graph, and the level of activity in the 20th group doesn't fall beneath 8%, according to our data, you're doing something right. If it's not like that, you might have to create more and more levels. What we do is basically to relaunch the game, adding uh, gradually more and more levels until we get it right. Um, and going to the last example that I think was also very interesting, at least for us, um, one of the ways to keep the player engaged is giving them rewards. And the most basic implementation of that is to let them pass through many stages. So if the user passes the stage, it gets uh, satisfied, and he continues to play, in the to play the game. And what we, wanted, what, what we wanted to measure is whether our games are doing a good job in, making, in letting the, the player, well, anyway, advance in the, the levels. So we couldn't find a benchmark for that as well, so we decided to uh, measure the level of uh, the maximum level that the users get to according to the percentile. So what you see here on the left-hand side are the 10% of the least active users and the level they get to. And it, go, it goes up until we get to the last group. These, these are the most active 10% of our users. And when we launch a game, we just make sure that the games fall in between the range. Now going to the conclusion, what we see is that in comparison to the first example, there is a very nice correlation between at least the six and seven percentile, which means that different games and different genres have a common denominator. Different players uh, pretty much behave the same uh, in different games. Now that means that if something falls below this range, there must, there must be something technically wrong in the game itself. So this actually happened to us. And we launched a game called Nino Chicken. 
And Ninja Chicken is a side-scroller um, game where you play a uh, chicken thinks he is a ninja, and you play through the levels. And in each level, you are presented with a different mission. In one mission, you have to cross a certain distance. In another mission, you have to uh, collect acorns. And specifically, in the second stage, what you have to do is to lay an egg. Now, when we launched the game, we saw a very, very significant decay between the second and the third levels. And that completely showed up in the reports, and we got an alert, and uh, we decided to look into the, to this uh, case and find out what is wrong in the second level. And it all goes down, boils down to the egg. Uh, apparently, since people didn't get, get across this level, they didn't know how to lay an egg. And the question is, how do we lay an egg in the game? So what we analyzed is that, for some reason, we didn't explain to the users how do they have to lay an egg. And we had a good reason to do that. Basically, in order to lay an egg, all, the, all you have to do is to jump above a nest. And if you jump above the nest, the chicken will later on just automatically lay an egg. And if something is usually very clear, there's no reason to overload the game with instructions and tips and text that most of the people don't read anyway. But in this case, they just didn't realize that this empty brown shape running across the screen is actually a nest because it didn't have any eggs inside. So what we did is basically just to add a short tip in the second level, telling the users that this is the way they can lay an egg. And usually when you do a very small change, it doesn't have a significant effect on the result of the game. But in this case, just by adding this tip, it completely changed the picture. And without having this small change, I think the game would not have been the success that it was. This game specifically, specifically got over than 10 million downloads on Google Play. The franchise uh, has over than 15 million downloads on Google Play. So that was very important for the success of the game. Um, now, if there is any message I would like you to take from this slide is that data analysis is basically our way to communicate with the users and listen to them. And today, when we distribute games, there's a very strong correlation between how the game is built, how the game is performing, and how much users you can get. Um, now, many companies are starting to do that, and that's, uh, that's actually a very good trend. Uh, some of them share the information, some of them don't. We do. Um, so if you want to get any more reports, data, some of the things that we learned from the Google Play, just contact us, and we would be glad to share the information. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, but I'd like to start with my first question. You process a lot of data. Uh, would you care to tell us the technology used in the back end? Is it SQL Server? Is it some custom solution that you've come up with? Yes, and we have a custom solution for uh, analyzing the data. And we started using uh, um, very, cast, you know, very um, uh, standard solutions like uh, Google Analytics. And then we added Splunk, if you know anyone knows this system. And now we have a BI layer and a data mining uh, um, visualization uh, layer. It's pretty much a full-time job. We have analysts going over the games every day, analyzing the reports, and creating new dashboards. Okay. Any questions? This is just to follow up on a previous question. Uh, many players are playing games offline. How do you guys uh, manage to send the data over to, do you store it on a local storage or, and push it later? Or? Yeah. Exactly. We save all the data, and then when the user connects again, everything is sent to our server. Eventually it happens, in most uh, smartphones. Oh, question up here. Okay, first of all, thank you for the presentation. And the point I found interesting was the, the, the graph where you showed the, the drop off of the, the number of players and then going up in the end and you finding out that the active players are the ones that consume a lot of levels. So the, the, I was curious what's your monetization model? Because of course, what you said in the beginning that building one or two levels, if majority of players just played those, would be fine. 
but only if you can make money, of course, because we have to pay our bills. So the, the, what's your overall conclusion and what is your, 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 your monetization model it's the, the, from that data? So is your conclusion build lots of levels so the people who become active players actually generate uh, revenue? Um, okay, that's a great question, actually. Um, so first of all, all of the games are based on a FIMI model, which means that uh, we have advertisement and we have in app purchases in the games. Um, what we learned is that some games are absolutely great for distribution, but they do really poorly on the monetization side. And you have other games that people, you know, when really they put into the market, it doesn't go to the top of the charts, but they do very well on monetizing the users because they have a deeper experience and they have a more engaging gameplay. Um, so one of the tricks is to know how to take the users from the most successful games and thus bring them to the games where they can actually monetize. Um, that's basically, that's uh, the secret sauce of having a game network. You have to put the players where they belong. I hope that uh, answered your question. Okay, another question here. Yes, uh, how do you manage your uh, quality assurance uh, processes and uh, your localization processes? Are you planning to translate the game in different languages or? So, um, localization wise, we don't localize the games. Uh, we just try to create games that don't have a lot of text inside. And that way we can just avoid uh, text translation. What we did do is to test a different segment of users from different regions, different locales. And we saw that there's a, practically, virtually, no difference between the different players. So we just saw no reason to uh, localize the games. And in terms of uh, finding bugs and you know, uh, what do you do? do? Do you do that internally, or uh, do you support yourself with a, an outsourced uh, company? Or F I'm sorry, I'm uh, finding bugs. Yes, yes. Uh, in, in your process, uh, do you use the services of an external company to help you to assure the quality of uh, of your product, or uh, you do that internally? Or um, okay, um, I didn't tell you um, all there is to know about the minis, but. What we have is basically a solution that includes development, distribution, and also data analysis. So we have our own development tools. And one of the advantage of having those tools is that they are, the, the advantage of these tools basically is the fact that once you create a game, you don't have to test it across all devices. We provide uh, performance analyzers, and um, the games that are submitted to us, we don't have to test, to test across, across all devices. We just know that, well, this is our technology. Um, otherwise, this would, be, would, would, would have been a big barrier uh, because testing the game across you know, the dozens of devices takes a lot of time. Yes. Um, and the, the reason why we could have made this change in a matter of hours and then, and then we launched again to the markets is the fact that we don't have to do it. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Time for one more question? Or if anybody's shy, EL will be here afterwards. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.